I'm Bar Makesh Mehar. I was the ex head of optics at Meta and ex research scientist at MIT. And I'm founding a new company called Brilliant, which is still a stealth company. Today, basically, my goal is to transfer to you as much knowledge as possible about optics of augmented reality and its limitations. First, I'm going to go over human vision limits. Basically, what are the specs? What are the ultimate specs for an augmented reality headset? Like, what is the maximum resolution, maximum field of view, you know, what is the ultimate, you know, specifications for augmented reality. Uh, then I'm going to do some introduction to different categories of optics that is used very briefly. And I'm going to pinpoint seven rules that is driven from, you know, uh, fundamental rules of optics that sets trade-offs and limitations of uh, on augmented reality displays. And finally, I'm gonna briefly touch on like category specific challenges and wrap it up with some conclusion. So what are the limits of human visual system? If you think about eye, eye is not actually a normal camera. It's a very weird biological system that does imaging, but it's not, you know, it's not a normal camera with a, you know, uh, you know, single lens and, you know, just a flat sensor. It has this curved uh, wall of cells at the back with this hole in the middle. So it's, it's a very weird kind of capturing uh, image, uh, image capturing system or camera. So some physical specifications, basically we can detect up to 500 frames per second, which is impacted by contrast and color. So I'm going to give you these numbers and take them with a grain of salt. Like if, if I tell this to vision scientists, um, they're going to say, well, you know, these numbers vary between different ages, between different races. It even varies, damn, if it even varies if you're taking alcohol or coffee, like these numbers can change a lot. But what I'm telling you today is basically an average number for average population and I'm really trying to pinpoint at least some rough numbers that you can use in your design, in your perception of what are the limits of AR and human perception. So we have around 60 pixel per degree kind of acuity on average, which if you don't consider the movements of the eye, uh, we have around 8 million sensors, light sensors at the back of, back of our retina. And if you consider this 60 pixel per degree, it means we have about 66.5 megapixels per eye considering the rotation. We have about dynamic range of one to one million, which is very high dynamic range. But again, these numbers varies on you know, the spatial frequency and different things. Um, and what I'm gonna talk about a little bit more is angular range and depth range, because these type of numbers are less tackled compared to the other ones which are tackled more in the old literature of uh, human visual perception. Uh, also on the color, we have around, it's, it's, you know, it's very debatable. There are different standards for colors and it's debated that we have somewhere around 2.4 to 10 million colors that we can distinguish. But color perception is a really very complex um, uh, neurological phenomenon that happens and it's difficult to like really break it down into just like simple numbers. But take it with a grain of, grain of salt, 10 million colors, okay? So <clears throat> if you look at the back of the eye, the sensors, the way they are distributed is actually very uneven. So you have at the center of this uh, retina, close to the fovea, you have very, very high peak density of the cells, which means that you have very high resolution there. And then suddenly this resolution drops like crazy, like exponentially. So we don't even have it like something similar that is to a uniform CCD. Our pixel density at the back of our eye is basically non-uniform. So as I mentioned, eight megapixel with, uh, without movement and with movement, you can consider it to be 66.5 megapixel. Rough estimate is about one arc minute, which is 60, it translates to 60 pixels per degree, but the maximum I could find in literature is about 0.3 of arc minute. If you have a very young eye and you have very <laughs> supervision in a way. All right, so in terms of temporal and chromatic profile, if you don't have any spatially varying information, for example, for just a plain white and black switching screen, the frequency that your eye can detect is about 60 to 90 hertz. And that's why originally the displays were uh, set to that, this, that frequency or that refresh rate. But there is a bunch of research that shows that if you have different colors or different spatial information, 
this actually can be extended significantly up to even 500 or 800 hertz. So for example, in the color green, if you have a certain spatial frequency in the image, you can detect even up to 800 hertz. And that's why gamers have been pushing the frame rate because they were like, hey, 60 hertz is not really cutting it for me. And this study, which was published in scientific reports, basically pinpoint that, that it, this number actually varies with color and spatial frequency. On the chromatic profile side, you can see down here, there are these profiles uh, that shows the profile, spectral profiles of our cones and our rods. And you can see there's actually big overlap. So although we have blue, green, and red cones that detect different colors, these cones are not like notch filters. They actually have a bunch of overlap and it's really our, our brain that do, doing some part of the processing as well. In terms of depth and um, a little bit more on XY, so our point spread functions and people who are familiar with uh, uh, optical imaging systems, they're familiar with point spread functions or even people who work with signal processing. It means basically if you have a point in the screen, this point is not gonna be exactly like a delta function at the back of your eye. It's going to become some sort of a Gaussian profile. And that, has, that means it has a, a spread function, basically. People in microscopy are very familiar with this. So you can see that um, we have this kind of spread function. And we have a different spread function in depth as well. Because we have a, a camera that has a varying lens. And this means that our point spread function is not just a planar thing. It's a, it's a volumetric thing. So we have XY profile and we have a Z profile. And that Z profile is, is basically what's called depth of field. We have depth of field in cameras as well. We have this depth of field that you can see in this middle graph that goes from uh, 0.4 diopter to all the way to 0.15 diopter. These are these distances uh, uh, that we consider them to be clear. Obviously, this depth of field is also a function of spatial frequency. So for example, if you have higher spatial frequency, it means that you get this blur in a narrow region. If you have less of a spatial frequency, which means you have these dark and white lines that are more separated apart, uh, then you can have, you can consider that your depth of field is slightly longer uh, in depth. So in terms of angular profile, we have about 120 vertical field of view and 100, 154 horizontal field of view per eye. Uh, but overall, one of the, uh, on the higher part of the spectrum, I've seen 220 horizontal field of view for both of the eyes. Now, the interesting thing is that this number varies significantly between the number that describes this binocular vision, which is the, the place where both of the eyes kind of overlap, their field of view overlaps. Um, that one is varying significantly by, by race. So, for example, if you're a if, if you have a flatter nose, you can have up to 30, 40 degrees larger binocular field of view. So these are kind of challenges that AR optic designers and headset designers should consider. In terms of binocular depth profile, um, uh, there is stereoscopic depth perception and monocular depth perception. And stereoscopic is similar to IMAX. You're using both of your eyes and stereoopsis, which is the difference between the images on the, your left eye and right eye to perceive depth. For monocular level, you're, uh, you're only using one eye. So you're changing the variations in your uh, uh, crystalline lens to, to detect depth. There are other depth cues which are kind of uh, um, related to psychophysical type of depth cues, which I'm not going to be talking about. I'm looking at eye only from from optics perspective here. So in the literature, the stereoscopic acuity is reported about 0.17 arc minute maximum and 0.5 arc minute on average. And there's this relation that gives you the thickness of these depth layers and the, and the stereoscopic acuity. Now this thickness, this range is called Panum's fusional area. So you can think of it this way. Basically, the, if you want to say what is the depth resolution of human perception, human visual perception, with both eyes, it's like some curving surfaces. But these surfaces, they kind of blur out. They, they have certain thickness to them, which is dependent on these stereoscopic acuity. And they get kind of fatter on the side. And as you go forward, these curved surfaces, they get flat at a distance called 
called abathic distance. So at, at a distance called abathic distance, this becomes completely flat like a wall. And then after that, it becomes actually convex toward your face, which is quite weird. So we did some simulation and you can see uh, this uh, 3D view of these depth levels. Basically, this is the human visual Z resolution with both eyes in a way. We have more resolution, very denser resolution close to our face. And as it goes further away, our resolution kind of drops. So it's non-uniform. And so what are these depth levels and what are, what are the problems uh, that we should tackle is, um, is kind, of, kind of the challenges that uh, we and my team have been thinking about a lot. Um, this is, again, the simulations and the graph on the right shows how this varies with, with the distance. You can see that, for example, with monocular vision, with one eye, we have a very bad depth perception as it goes further to the distance. And also this varies between dark and more brighter area. So let me go. This is a simulation that shows these depth levels. I don't have much time, I believe. I have only a few more minutes. So this is again accommodation which shows how well our crystalline lens varies in terms of diopter as we age. And you can see as we age, our diopter range drops significantly. So again, if you do simulations, you can see the depth resolutions by these lines here, as it goes further away, it gets really, really sparse. And if you do the calculation, here are the ultimate specifications that would saturate human perception for an augmented reality headset. So basically, something around 8K per eye, around 100 monocular depth levels. That's a complete overkill. So it's a very uh, completely saturating human vision. 20, 2,800 stereoscopic corruptors. These are the stereoscopic depth levels. 10,000 nits, which is like a bright as a daylight and one to one million dynamic range is crazy. So it will basically definitely saturate. Now, this would be undistinguishable from reality. A more practical numbers would be these kind of numbers. So um, basically, I have the specifications in these slides, which you can look into um, and uh, all nailed down. These charts give you what are the practical numbers that would be basically the ultimate specifications of the augmented reality headset. What I wanted to go through was basically there are two types of passive optics that is used in the entire market. That is geometrical optics and wave, waveguide optics. Meta was maybe flagship for geometrical optics. These are all geometrical optic headsets. Then wave optics is mostly uh, led by HoloLens and Magic Leap. And so there are seven rules that I wanted to mention, which basically gives fundamental limitations and, and trade-offs of augmented reality. These seven rules are one, subunity uh, MTF, modulation transfer function, which reduces the accuracy of the pixels to the fact that the, degra the degradation of perturbation accumulates. So if you're using a waveguide, the more reflections you have instead of the waveguide, the worse color accuracy you get. Three is the reciprocity, which means if you have more transparent glasses, you're gonna also have a less efficient glasses. That's based on Helholm, Helholm's uh, reciprocity principle. The Fermont's principle, which uh, it tells that, that the light rays go in a straight line, sets a limitation on field of view and exit pupil. And uh, here's an example, I'm not gonna go over it. Uh, field of view and eye box also have an interesting trade-off based on the conservation of Eton Dew. There's, if you have larger eye box, you're gonna reduce brightness based on the conservation of energy. Um, seventh law is basically the additive augmentation reality reduces the contrast. These formulas predicts how bad this contrast is gonna be impacted. So basically, you're go always gonna see these images kind of like being like a ghost if you have additive augmented reality. Here yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit on category specific challenges for geometrical and uh, waveguide based. Um, one of the major challenges in geometrical uh, approaches is always having to deal with some sort of distortion and aberration because you have curved surfaces. For the waveguides, you always have to deal with some sort of diffraction or haze. And that's and the field of view is also going to be always some of the major challenges. In summary, basically conclusion is that this talk gives you the ultimate spec of what, what are the specifications of augmented reality. and basically walks you through seven rules that will ultimately fundamentally limit augmented reality glasses in 
from the optics perspective. You can always access these websites. If you're interested, you can contact me. A bunch of positions opening up and uh, keep in touch. Thank you so much. Thank you.